first of all, what is cryptology? Now, I keep on saying cryptography, but this is technically, I'm going over cryptology rather than cryptography. However, we're focusing on cryptography. So cryptology is a study of cryptography and cryptanalysis. Uh, cryptography is literally the study of secret writing. This includes ciphers and encryptions, not stenography. Uh, that's kind of on its own, word, own world. Um, a code is replacing words with other words. You don't actually see these very often because of the, the required mapping from one code to another. So other than in the military where there's a very limited jargon, it really doesn't help much. However, codes are very hard to break for the same reason they're hard to implement because you can totally change anything. It's not mathematically based. Well, it is sort of mathematically based, but it's not. The security doesn't come from the mathematics. It comes from I'm totally replacing one thing with another. And uh, stenography, that's the art of hiding messages. Um, like I said, we won't really talk about that right now. If there's somebody interested in it, I find it really interesting and we might go into detail. Uh, anyway, this presentation is mostly about cryptography because that is the most useful thing to know about <clears throat> for an average developer. So what's a cipher? They're just algorithms for performing in, in, encryption or decryption. They replace characters at an individual level, level, so character by character rather than replacing word by word. Um, there are some other variations that are a bit bigger than that, but never mind, those are kind of niche. So cipher and encryption, those are two pretty much interchangeable terms, so I flip-flop back and forth between them, so you, know, you, shouldn't get, you shouldn't worry about it. If you hear me switch between them, it's because it's the same thing, basically. So there are three basic categories of encryption. The first is symmetric, that's where there's one key and it both encrypts and decrypts. <clears throat> the second one is asymmetric encryption. This is the one that really revolutionized cryptography about 40 years ago now. This has two different keys, a public key and a private key. One is used to encrypt and one is used to decrypt. And then finally there's cryptographic hashes. I don't really know that I like calling these part of cryptography, but everybody always tells me to include them, so I include them anyway and they're covered in pretty much every course on cryptography. These are one-way functions that are really hard to forge. We'll get into more detail about that in a moment. So what's cryptanalysis? Well, really briefly, it's basically trying to find a weakness in an encryption algorithm <clears throat> and trying to figure out how you can exploit that weakness to read the message. There's basically two different people who use cryptanalysis, two different types of people. One is a security researcher find, trying to figure out how hard it is going to be to break an encryption algorithm. The other is an attacker trying to read your message without you uh, giving him the key. Cryptanalysis is often stumped over the short term, but generally I've noticed in the long term they tend to beat encryption. Although if you keep your encryption up to date, it's really not a problem. There are a couple of different types of ciphers. You've got monoalphabetic ciphers, which are also called substitution ciphers. These are basically you take, you know, you might have actually done these as a kid. You have two alphabets, one is a regular alphabet, you take the characters from your um, message that you're encrypting, you say, okay, here's my plain text alphabet, here's a corresponding cipher alpha text that is either cipher alphabet that is either shifted or totally mixed up, so I'll just say, I directly come down here and here's my cipher based on that. So I, did that make sense that I explained that in an understandable way? I felt like I was vague, but everybody's nodding, so. Yeah, you, you got one alphabet, Exactly. It's, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. I thought about putting it up on here, but I'm trying to streamline my slides a little bit because uh, I tend to put up too much information. I'm going to give a base, brief, a really quick history of cryptolog cryptology. Initially, it was transposition ciphers and monoalphabetic ciphers, substitution ciphers. These have been used since like, you know, 2000, 3000 BC. Who knows when they actually started getting used, but long, long time. One of the more common ones was a Caesar cipher. This is one the characters are simply shifted by a set amount. This is still monoalphabetic. This was actually reportedly used by Julius Caesar, as you might have expected, to communicate with his generals. Of course, substitution ciphers like these are ridiculously easy to break. You can use what's called frequency analysis. This was apparently discovered by Al Kindi, who is an Arab polymath and, ma polymath and mathematician from the ninth century, but I have a feeling it was found before to some degree. Frequency analysis. Basically what you do is you have uh, a listing of how many times a certain letter occurs and you say, okay, I'm seeing in this encrypted message 
this character keeps on popping up, so it's probably this mapped over letter. English, the first letter you're going to find is E. After that, it's going to be one, some of the other vowels. Then it's T, I think, and then it goes from there. Basically, really easy to break as a result of frequency analysis. Now, one interesting little side note, because I mentioned that Al-Kindi, in the ninth century, the Arab empires, I can't remember specifically which one, there were two at the time that were, yeah. Anyway, one of them was actually really advanced comparatively speaking, in encryption. They were using polyalphabetic ciphers, which is where you have multiple cipher alphabets. We'll talk about that in a moment. And the interesting thing is like two or three hundred later, they had lost even the ability to break a simple transposition or substitution cipher. Then you get into polyalphabetic ciphers, which like I said, they had had before this, but they started becoming really well known in about the 15th century. Now, a polyalphabetic cipher is, uh, it has a whole bunch of different cipher alphabets instead of just one. The most famous is, is the Fignier cipher, which I may be mangling that name. It's uh, Italian? French? Anyway, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. It uses 25 different uh, cipher text alphabets, and what you do is you pick uh, a key that selects which of those cipher alphabets you map from your uh, particular character in a word. So you basically have like a phrase, and you say, well, if my first letter is the, word K, is the letter K, in my key, then I'll pick the cipher alphabet starting with a K, because they're all shifted, and then I'll use that to do the mapping on this character from my original text. Everybody follow that? Actually, I Luke's struggling with it, we can tell yeah. from uh, 26 uh, alphabets. Yeah. One of them is plain text, the other ones are all shifted. One from the preceding one. Well, then you don't get any numbers. Any numbers. Oh, yeah, you don't, I mean, I'm sure you could account for them, but you could always just write the numbers out. Or other than, did, did you have a problem with it other than that? Hmm. I can do a quick example on the board if anyone's interested. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I can already tell this is going <laughs> to go wrong. Oh, yeah, a anyway, um, this cipher, this is why I said that cryptanalysis eventually will get the better of, some, of a, most ciphers. It went unbroken for around 400 years before Charles Babbage broke it in the 19th century. Now it's recognized as being extremely weak. It's comparable to an XOR encryption algorithm, which anybody who's been at one of these meetings before knows I love to bash XOR encryption. Or one of the things that happened in the 19th century along with this is cryptography started developing and they started to realize that the secrecy of the, cryptograph the encryption algorithm is not the same thing as security. Any questions? Um, it says there in modern terms, security through obscurity does not work. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So security through obscurity is when I try to hide what I'm doing from you. Right. Like not, not, okay, let me start over. So that's when I try to hide my security mechanisms from you. Okay. So let's say I've got an encryption algorithm to encrypt, you know, my highly secret data. You know, Luke's probably using it to hide his information about his lasers he's using to take over the world, right? Yeah. Um, that's going to be a running joke, by the way. Okay. Um, <laughs> what was the question? So it was about um, right security through obscurity. So you hide the mechanism. So I want to protect that data. So yeah. obviously that data should be obscured, but my encryption algorithm that's protecting that data should not have to be secret to make sure that nobody can figure out how to break that encryption on my data. Does that make sense? It shouldn't have to be secret. That's right. The key should be secret, and obviously the data should be secret. The encryption algorithm should be public. If you can't that would be publish a generalized it, algorithm, let's say, kind of. If you're modifying the algorithm, you've probably screwed up. Okay. Encryption is notoriously hard to get right. Okay. Basically, okay. if you've written your own algorithm or you've implemented it yourself, you've probably done it wrong. Okay. So I talk about that in a little bit actually. That's the obscurity that you talk try and obscure your method, then your methodology is probably wrong. Yeah. I see. So, and I mean, I'll... Somebody sees your method and they say, oh, that's the correct method, that actually works, then it's probably right. I see. Yeah. Ba basically, what usually happens is one set of eyes cannot figure out all the flaws in an encryption algorithm or any security system in, in reality. It takes a lot of people looking at it before they catch the problems. Okay. There's no standardized way of detecting security problems. Okay. Were you going to say something? Well, I was... Exactly. Like uh, the, the movie uh, Mercury Rising, they had a 
security algorithm, and they publish, they put it in a, in a game book to, to put in the, uh, the wildcard factor. You know, you decoded this, you call the phone number, and quote, you got a, you won a prize. If you were actually able to decode it and call the phone number, it meant the thing was broken. And then they tried to kill the kid who got it because, you know, government garbage. Bruce Willis. Yeah, I've never seen the movie Needless to Say, but... Well, it, it, it's, it's 15 years old. But basically, it was, it was a cyber... We're going to do cyber security by obscurity, and we're going to kill the one person who could actually fix it. <laughs> That's kind of the way we try to deal with it. Mercury Rising. <laughs> okay. Anyway, does, does, does that make sense now? Yeah, I think, I think, and I think it'll become more clear. Pro probably. We'll get in more details. If, if you don't understand later on, certainly come back at the conclusion and ask me about it, because that's a big deal. Okay. Yeah. But I think it's huge. So here's, I think this is my last history slide. There might be one other. Um, the reason, by the way, I, I am doing the history is because it, the background to cryptography, in my opinion, is important because it helps you understand I can screw this up if I try to do it, if I try to make my own thing. That's the whole thing about security to obscurity there. I can do it wrong. A lot of programmers especially think, I'm the smartest one out there. <laughs> and then they go write their XOR encryption algorithm and it just gets busted horribly. So anyway, the thing that really kicked off the use of machines in cryptography, I mean, there was some dating back to like the 15th century, but was the Enigma uh, machine. I hope that somebody in here has heard of this previously. At least we've got him. The uh, Enigma machines had three rotating rubber disks with embedded wires to do the basic encryption. There was also a plug board that set the initial conditions of the encryption. This was initially broken by the Polish before the start of World War II. Well, actually, it was after the start of World War II, but before they got invaded by the Germans using what they called bombs, which were basically a, a reworking of the Enigma machine that allowed them to brute force it, brute force combinations. Before they got invaded, they handed over the machines and everything else they had to the British, who were then able to regularly break the messages of both the Army and the Air Force. Like I said, the, the Navy was using an, an additional two rotors, <clears throat> and they were more careful than the other two branches of the military. So they were actually never able to break it on the Navy. They did steal it like you were mentioning. They went and they stole the, the code book is actually what they cared about the most, but they wanted the rotors too. So they were actually in the end able to break all of them, but they kind of cheated on the last one. But it's not really cheating in war. So but one of the efforts, although it didn't actually directly relate to the Enigmas, it was a different cipher they were trying to break, but... The British also developed the Colossus during their efforts. This was the first fully electronic and digital program and programmable computer ever. After World War II, the state of the art in cryptography started advancing a little bit more rapidly. In 1945, Claude Shannon, also known for the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem for our ECE majors, he proved that one-time pads are perfectly secure. Now, a one-time pad, that's when I take... So Luke got all excited there about something. A one-time pad is when... <laughs> is when I take random data and I say XOR it. See, this is the one case where you can use XOR, but this is effectively useless, and I'll explain why in a minute. You XOR that data with your data that you're trying to encrypt. The thing is, is you can never repeat that, that key. So it's called, that's why it's called the pad, and it's the one-time pad. If you ever repeat that key, suddenly your encryption can be broken. The Russians had this happen to them, so, you know. They were sending messages in the 30s with one-time pads. They ran out. They started repeating using them in the 60s. The NSA broke some messages. From both the current and the old. Anyway, um, I, I get a little excited about this. Once you use it a second time. Once you use it a second time, the security is gone yeah. entirely. Both. Anyway, in, as part of the advancement of the state of the art, in 76, the data encryption standard was developed. This is what predated AES, we no longer use this, but at the time this was kind of a big deal because the U.S. government came out and said, here is the cipher we suggest. Here's the thing that we say are secure. Admittedly, they knew about some holes in it. They knew about some holes in the security. The NSA had, I think it was differential analysis that would work on significantly weakening DES, but never mind. Um, now we're not using it, so uh, yeah. Questions? Uh, this is Everybody understand the, the logic behind the XOR? I, mean, I know. That's I a good question. But, uh, I'm assuming in that, in it, that example it, you, there, it, you have a pad, let's say, of one to zero. So what I mean, what, what I think you're asking is, is everyone familiar with what XOR means? You're not? 
Um, so, so that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. I didn't even think about it. XOR <laughs> is a term from digital logic. Um, do you know what a logical operator is from programming? Do we have any markers? No. There are no markers in the room. Oh. Well, I would write it on the board to help show you. So, it's okay. it's digital. do you know what, <laughs> from programming, do you know what a logical AND is? What programming language would you use? You, you probably, you're probably familiar with it, but I'm trying to phrase it in terms of the programming language, because they probably didn't teach it to you as being called a logical AND. So what programming language are you familiar with? <laughs> you don't know what language you use? I mean, like English? Like, what programming language? I mean, yeah. So I, I don't want to explain it from the the, the chip standpoint because I think it's going to be harder to pull it in from that way. So I, not knowing what programming language you use, you, you should really find out, uh, <laughs> and then maybe go spend some time with it again. So you, yeah. Anyway. So if if you were to use an if statement, let's say I had two boolean values, right? Can you remember what boolean values are? Okay. So let's say I had two boolean values. And if they were both true, that is the only condition where I'm going to execute it. You've probably seen that, right? Yeah. That's called an AND operator. So that's a logical okay. AND. Okay. This is true and this is true. There's another operator called an OR operator. This is true or this is true. So either one of them or both of them can be true in order to execute that statement. So XOR statement is exclusive OR. So what that says is this is true or this is true, but, if they're, but not both. Only one can be true. So exclusive OR. So that's what XOR means. Um, <coughs> and so how would you do that? How would you use that XOR in combination with encryption? I really wish I could write on the board. So that what that means is if I take a key. Well, let's just say my data is well, one zero one. Well, that's right? what I was about to say. If I want to take a key that is just a binary string, okay. and I have data that is just a binary string, right. I take my XOR, and that will flip the bit based on whether the key string is a zero or a one. So anyway, my, what I was going to say is if, if there's something like that you don't know, feel free to ask me. It's probably good. I'm recording it, so I'd like it. If there's things that's not common knowledge, I'm not always going to recognize that. So definitely your, speak up. Now your key needs to be the same size as the data, right? Yes, your key has to be the same size as the data. Wow. You're asking leading questions here, Luke. We're getting to we're getting to one-time pads, so <laughs> we'll so get into the... Just use random data, or not, I mean, random so can we save it for a few minutes? Let's get let's get onto that screen. So, okay, so there is one more. I'll go through it kind of quickly. So in 1976, uh, asymmetric cryptography came into existence with the Diffie-Hellman protocol. This is a big deal because what this means is symmetric cryptography, obviously, if I have a key, I have to give you that key directly. So there's this big weak link of how do I transmit that key to you. Asymmetric cryptography means I can give you a key that it can only decode data that I've sent with my private key. So I can encode, say, a, uh, a key of, for a symmetric cipher because these tend to be really expensive to do, mathematically speaking, so they take a lot of operations. I can use an asymmetric protocol to encode a symmetric key and send it over a secure channel and bypass this whole secure channel problem. Revolutionizing cryptography, allowing for commercial sites to work on the internet, basically. Diffie-Hellman's problem is you had to be online at the same time to exchange it. RSA in 78 meant that you could generate static keys. Uh, in 1998, this is no longer asymmetric, the EFF demonstrated the weakness of DES. They did this with a, a custom DES cracker, which they built for $250,000, which if you extrapolate today's terms, you could probably do that with a run-of-the-mill desktop. And they were able to brute force a DES key in about two days. So, yeah, that's why we don't use DES. We use AES, or if we have to, triple DES. Any questions? Uh, AES, what do you think? We'll talk about it in a few minutes. All right, because that's symmetric cryptography is what's coming up. So now we're out of the boring part for some people. <laughs> the history part is over with. So symmetric cryptography, it uses a single key, like I mentioned. Every party that needs to decrypt or encrypt anything has to use that key. A good key is composed of random data. The more random it is, the better. However, usually what you do is you use a key expander, um, which basically is you take random data and plug it into a pseudo-random number generator. It's not exactly what it is, but it's close enough. Um, I already talked about monocyph monos alphabetic ciphers and poly 
alphabetic ciphers. Any questions? Here's where we get into the one-time keys. I talked about this a bit. The key cannot repeat. You're XORing the key with a random, with the, the XORing a key composed of random data with the message. Key cannot repeat. Ciphers, other ciphers attempt to imitate this using key expansion, but of course they really can't. Um, one-time pads are the only encryption algorithm which can provide perfect security, which means that you cannot break it and you cannot gain any information about the content of the message just by looking at the encrypted message. Of course, it's entirely unpractical for most users because that means if I store a, a five gigabyte file, I have to have five gigabytes of key, which I have to protect. So totally impractical for almost every situation. Questions? Um, and you're saying that the reason the this, this whole idea of using, that would be XOR encryption, right? This is the only time you can use XOR encryption, yes. And the reasoning behind why it cannot be used with more, with, let's say, a two-time pad, would be that you'd be able to... So what happens... The encrypted information would be the same. If, I XOR, if I XOR the two encrypted pieces of data, uh -huh. and say they had, like, a character that's the same, so let's say spaces line up, right. then it starts becoming apparent where those spaces were because I start getting patterns emerging. Yeah, so basically it allows me to eventually extrapolate the key. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go deeply into the details of that because one-time pads are not practicable and it's late. If you're interested in it, I can point you to resources or we can talk about it at a later point, okay. but let's save it because I think people are getting bored. Uh, we haven't talked about anything practical yet. So block ciphers, this is where we start getting into something practical. A block cipher operates on a block of data. That's just a chunk of data. Um, these are extremely common in cryptography anymore. Um, they come in two basic forms. That's an iterated block cipher, which is where you use a function that is called a round, and you apply it a whole bunch of times to the blocks. Basically, you're trying to mash up the data. That's what that's all block ciphers do, is they try to mash the data up with a key so that you can't extract the key or the data. A FISAL cipher is really similar to an iterative block cipher, except it splits the key in, or the, the, mess, the, the block in half. It uses the round on one half of the data, and the other half is then XORed with that data, and then you repeat the process. Like I said, basically you're repeating it. Questions? Okay, so here's a quick term for you, an initialization vector, usually referred to just as IV if you go look at some comments and code. This is a unique value that basically sees certain types of block cipher uh, operation. So the modes of operation, these are how you apply the block cipher basically. The original one is called electronic cookbook. In here, each block is independently encrypted with the key. Uh, as a result, if you have repeating data, the cipher text repeats. And that means I can start getting patterns from your data, I can get information back from your data, and I may eventually be able to extract data or entirely break and get all the data instead of just part of it. Basically, it severely weakens, if not entirely weakens, the algorithm you're using. Um, the next is cipher block chaining. This is basically the successor to ECB. This is where you XOR the plain text block that precedes the encrypted block. Sorry, you, you, you XOR the preceding encrypted block, so the block you just encrypted, with the current plain text block. Now, this is where the initialization vector comes in. For the very first plain text block, you XOR that with the IV and then you have your random data, or actually your unique data, so that you have your start for your repeating value. There are a couple interesting things about CBC, like the fact that, a lot, that you can actually decrypt it in parallel, but that's detailed and I don't want to go into it. There's a few other less common modes, like cipher feedback, output feedback, and counter feedback. Um, counter feedback is interesting because it lets the cipher act as a stream cipher. We'll get into stream cipher in a minute, so don't anybody ask. Questions? No. All right, so what's a stream cipher? Basically, this tries to emulate an, uh, a one-time pad. It, creates, it takes a stream of bits, and it, it tries to XOR them with a string of random bits. It's not necessarily XOR, but you get the idea. There are two types of these stream ciphers, synchronized, synchronous stream ciphers. This is where it generates a stream of pseudorandom data, so the key stream, independently of the message, and then it will generally XOR those two things together. A self-synchronizing stream cipher, what that uses instead is a, uh, it uses previous ciphertext characters to compute the key string. So that's where like the counter mode comes into. And in fact, usually on the self-synchronizing, you're going to end up seeing a block cipher being used in a stream cipher-like mode. Questions?
I'll talk about a couple algorithms really rapidly. We already talked a bit about DES. This is outdated. Don't use it. It's based on Faisal. Just don't use it. Just don't use it. Triple DES. It applies the keys three times. It applies three different keys and applies DES three times using each of those key sizes. This expands the key size from its original 56-bit key. By the way, this is based on 64-bit block sizes. If anyone was interested, it expands the 56-bit key to approximately 128. So it's about the equivalent of 128-bit AES. However, it's really slow under most conditions. The only time you should use triple DES is if you happen to be on a legacy system where it has hardware support for DES. In this case, it may be faster than using AES. Are there any questions? I show you, by the way, how, to, how the encryption is applied. You actually use the decrypt function in the middle, but that basically works out to the same thing as having encrypted it. So. Doesn't, doesn't this kind of show that DES into the future could wind up being a more uh, solid encryption method? No. You can always quadruple. You could do the same thing with AES, and okay. AES allows you, is already got, I think, up to at least five 12-bit key sizes, okay. which is, what, you know, four or five times bigger than this is, so, than even triple does, and AES is less expensive to do because it's not it's doing that, expensive. yeah, it's less computationally expensive, so it's quicker and it's more secure. No, because, you, like I said, you can, basically, you could do the same thing with AES. You're basically, we're basically talking about Encrypting something once with one key, encrypting that encrypted data with another key, and encrypting that again. Yeah. You can do the same thing with AES. You can encrypt encrypted data again. Any other questions? And they do have hardware support for AES these days. Yes. Most modern CPUs will support it. Any other questions? So quickly through AES. AES is the replacement for DS. It replaced it in 2001. It was picked by competition. There are a few um, other finalists that are interested, but we won't talk about them. Its key lengths are 128, 192, and 256 with a block size of 128. Like I said, I think there may be a 512 implementation, but I don't know off the top of my head. AES is government industry standard, so if you're planning to work with encryption at all, you're probably going to be encountering AES a lot. AES should be your go-to block cipher as a developer. <laughs> Just don't screw around with the other stuff is what it basically boils down to. The only the thing about encryption here, and this is mostly applied to AES, but technically anything in, it, in the same class of encryption algorithms, they, some of the strengths are export restricted by the U.S. Are there any questions? And import restricted by a lot of other countries. Oh, yeah. Import restricted by other countries. Yeah, take, for instance, Pakistan, where you can have a bit like, uh, key size no larger than 56 bits. Their, their government doesn't allow you to enter the country. Their government does not allow you to export software to Pakistan. So you cannot buy p software in Pakistan that allows you to use more than 56-bit keys. I thought it was our government that stopped. Stop. No, ours prevents us from exporting more than, I think, the 192-bit key lengths. Okay. But I'm not sure. And you can do it with special licenses. But ours does not stop people from importing. Our government recognizes at least that that part of the cat is already out of the bag, even though they haven't realized that as far as the export thing goes, it's ridiculous, too. Because, well, I can get it anyway. I mean, I can get it from yeah, Australia. It's kind of funny that... Uh, why? What they're doing, we're talking about somebody who wants to be able to read all their citizens' emails. It's about making sure that I can break your encryption so that I can read what you're doing as a government, so I can keep an eye on you. Okay, so what they're saying is the reason why you can't import these is because we're not going to be able to watch it. Exactly. It's a cheaper way of doing what the NSA is trying to do. Okay. <laughs> Which is, of course, to build the computers fast enough to break it even though it's got a big key size. <laughs> You gotta remember, this is a weapon of war in that secure communications between two locations. Oh yeah, I mean, is considered a weapon of war. If I know what well, my opponent's doing between these two things, I have an advantage. Cryptography is actually classified as ammunition under U.S. law. Yeah. So, not treated like it for the most part, but it is classified as ammunition. There's no doubt about, no doubt about it. Uh, any other questions? So the basics of asymmetric encryption, I'm going to try to really fly through this. Uh, it uses two separate keys, like I said. The security depends on it being really expensive to do the operations to use your asymmetric encryption. So this generally means using prime factorization or now what is called elliptic curve cryptography, which I'm not going to go into because it gets uh, mathy really quick. And it's really not important for this discussion. So asymmetric encrypt encryption allows you to sign data, which means that if you sign data with your private key and I can decrypt it with your public key, that implies that you, as the possessor of that private key, 
have certified that this is the data you meant to send. So that's a repudiation thing. Generally, like I said, asymmetric cryptography, you basically send the symmetric key because the uh, computational expensiveness of using asymmetric encryption. So, questions? Is there a reason to uh, change IAP uh, in asymmetric encryption that it hasn't been broken? It reduces the risk that your key has somehow leaked without you knowing it. That's the real reason why you change good keys anyway. Any other questions? So, we're not going to go into all, we're, we're going to basically skip the details in the middle here, but I will walk you through the picture. Diffie-Hellman, which is the original one, is the orig easy one to understand. Um, you take a secret, or you take common val values that are in common, you exchange common values, you have a secret value, a secret color, and you add that in some form, in this case using exponentiation and mod, to your common colors, your common numbers. You switch the results of those, you input your secret values, you combine your secret values with those values you've just exchanged, and then you get the common secret. And so suddenly you both have basically the same number. And that allows you to see, say, a random number generator and know that you both have the same key. That's, Did, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. I mean, it's just simple math addition. Actually, well, it's, it's not addition per se, but the math is actually pretty straightforward if you look at it. You're taking exponentiation and you're using modulus. Those are the two operators that you're dealing with. For Diffie Hellman, RSA, which we're just going to entirely blow off the algorithm for, oh, okay. is a little bit harder to understand because it allows you to use the static keys, but it's using similar concepts. But yeah, it's the same concept as what you just showed. Well, similar concepts, not the same concept. Not exactly the same. So basically, keys here are generated with prime numbers. So the hard part about breaking RSA is because the, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with factoring, but there's basically one way of doing it. You methodically go through all your potential candidates and you see if they work. <laughs> and so it's really expensive to find the two prime numbers that have been multiplied together to make your key. And so that's basically what the security of RSA rests upon. Are there, and of course, I'm not covering any more asymmetric encryption algorithms. There are several more. An interesting one, for instance, is the Elgamal, which is used in PGP. But I'm not going to talk about that in detail, yeah. It, it doesn't seem like there would be that many prime numbers as to, as to make it hard to find two prime numbers. If you know only two prime numbers are required to make the key. Well, you got to remember there's also a modulus involved that makes it harder to guess the key at random. So you're having to do operations on top of that. Oh, okay. And I could go you're pull not, up. You're not seeing the key. That's the problem. Yeah, if you were to go take, yeah, you're not seeing the key. If you were to go take a look at prime number lists, they're huge. Okay. And because factoring is so expensive, yeah, it, it doesn't work out. Okay. Anyway, okay. are there any other questions? This is a biggie, so if you didn't understand something. So the PKI, which is the public key infrastructure, the PKI is basically a, a mechanism to distribute public keys. Because you're distributing public keys, this also can allow you a mechanism for identifying and authenticating users. If I can determine that this is actually your public key, then I can say that anything that is signed by you is obviously from you. But that's a painful set system to set up. It's really hard to do, and it's almost impossible to set up in a decentralized mechanism. The closest we've got is, again, used by uh, email encryption like PGP, which is called Chains of Trust, which is basically I sign your key, and because somebody trusts my key, they trust your key. The most common PKI, PKI, however, is the one that handles SSL, or as somebody corrected me the other day, it's technically TLS, but everybody still says SSL. Um, so these, are, these certificates basically identify an organization or individual. They say this public key goes with this person, and the place you most commonly see them, although they are by no means restricted to this, is when you connect to a site that has that little lock icon on it, so it's HTTPS. That's actually using SSL in the background. And so it's attempting to identify to you and confirm that you're actually receiving data from this organization rather than from some random guy who sent you a phishing email that you fell for. Um, questions? Again, this is another fundamental concept, and it was specifically mentioned for next week's presentation on network security that he wanted people to have a fundamental understanding. So if there's any questions, now, that I, now it's time to ask. Well, that, is, that is a normal thing for somebody to send an email or for a fisher to send an email saying, I'm your bank, and you need to log on to your account, click yep. on this link to go on yeah. to your account. Yeah, it really is, but 
Social engineering, let's save it. Sorry, I'm trying to get us through. Hashes. We're getting near the end, you see? 20 of 25. Um, I, I put that on there for you guys, by the way, because I keep on having long presentations. You know when we're getting near the end and you can stop the suffering. So a hash function is basically an algorithm that takes an arbitrarily sized data input and it returns a fixed size fixed sized bit string. There are three properties that are important for a good hash. The first is pre-image resistance. This is that given a hash, it should be find a, find, it should be hard to find a message that will, using that same hash algorithm, give you out the same hash as you started with. The second is second pre-image resistance. That's given an input M, it should be hard to find a different message M, which would be M2, where those two messages are not equal to each other, but the hashes of the two messages are equal to each other. And then the final is collision resistance, and this one is really easy to get mixed up with second image, pre-image resistance, at least in my opinion. It took me a good 20 minutes to figure out the difference. This is, it should be difficult to find two messages where they're not equal to each other, such that one hash, so that both hashes equal each other. Now, does everybody get that distinction based on what we've got here and what I said, or shall I give my additional information that I have written here explaining the distinction? Well, I don't understand why pre-image resistance combined with second pre-image resistance doesn't do the job of collision resistance. Okay, so I've got a little bit of information here that I'll read off. I, re I understood at the time, but Wait, every time... Hash M1 and hash M2, those are two different types of hashing? No, they're the same hash. Let, let me read this off to you, and I'll probably remember it while I go on. So, okay, so unlike... Okay, here's the difference. I remember it again. In second pre-image resist in second pre-image resistance, you're given one input. Okay. In collision resistance, you're starting with two inputs and you're trying to make them match. That is what I wanted to write. No, that's wrong. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry, it really is it really is a fine distinction and it actually matters. Second pre-image you're finding any pair of messages. So this basically says the hash algorithm is weak, period. In collision resistance, you're finding a specific message and finding an output that equals it. Now, the difference here is if I can be given a message and I want to make a, and I want to substitute a new message for it by beating that hash, yeah. that's a common goal for an attacker, right? With second pre-image, it's just saying, well, this is weak, but in some cases, Basically, second pre-image just means that I can get any two messages, it doesn't matter what they are, and show that I can make a common hash out of them. Does that make sense now? Hmm. So it has to do with the way that M1 and M2 are obtained. Well, yeah, basically, because for second pre-image, you can basically find any message you want. For collision resistance, you have to make sure that yeah. Given a message, you can't replace it with a malicious message. So you can't replace it all. So basically, one, you have, you already have a message, the other you don't. You just get to pick any message you want. Does it make sense now? So what are hashes used for? Basically to verify that data hasn't been changed. They're often used with digital signatures because if you just hash a message and then sign that hash, that saves a lot of time over actually signing the entire message. And if it's a cryptographically strong hash, that's not a problem. Any more questions? The, the hash is used for ISOs. ISOs? Oh, right. Yeah. CD images. Yes. They usually use MD5, which is weakened, but it is technically a cryptographic hash. Uh, SH1 is not yet weakened. SH2 is what you really want to be using. But keep in mind, the weakening on MD5 is very limited. The likelihood that they could manipulate it such that you, could have, you would have a malicious image is fairly low. But if you can use SH1 or SH2, or better yet, just flat out a digital signature, do that. Okay. There's some interesting things about hashes, like the fact that even if I've included a hash with an, with an ISO, if I'm an attacker and I replace that ISO, I'm probably just going to replace the hash while I'm at it, because they're usually stored in the same place. They don't actually do you much good from a security standpoint. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, that's useful. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if you could get the hash from a different location, then okay, but a, a secure channel. You know but if they're all the same way, usually aren't that big. No, they're usually a fixed length sum of like so, say 50 characters. Right. So like let's say I've got a, a scanner that actually gives me an SH5 hash um, when when I tell it to based on the, the scan of an ISO on my computer. Obviously. Uh, 
when you say scanner, you mean a program, a function to compute the hash. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So I can take that hash and go look it up online and verify that as well. Yeah, but like I said, if if the attacker if it's stored on the same place as the ISO was stored, then they're probably going to have just replace the hash with a. But I mean, if multiple websites are. All if verified. multiple websites have it, unless they all got compromised, yes. It helps. <laughs> Digital signatures are still better because then unless the private key leaked, it can't be replaced. Anyway, as far as using encryption as an end user, uh, we actually see it a lot. We see it on websites like I mentioned, e-commerce, banking, stuff like that. This has its associated PKI of SCL like I'm, SSL like I mentioned. By the way, that stands for Secure Socket Layer. I forgot to mention that. Um, I won't get into the technical details of that protocol because it doesn't matter for this uh, talk. Hard drive, hard drive encryption that Luke was complaining about, you get like BitLocker, which is the Microsoft solution, TrueCrypt, which is an open source solution, cell phones, cell phones actually encrypt the texts in the phones as they go to the tower. Don't think that this protects you when you're sending a text because A, that tower is the thing that's got the key, not the recipient. B, some, the tower is not authenticated to the phone, so an attacker can set up a tower <laughs> the phone authenticates the, the attacker, and the attacker gets all your messages. This has been demonstrated at, um, what's that big Las Vegas con? DEF CON. They've had this demonstrated at DEF CON amongst other places. And you don't have to build a tower to do this. You just have to have the radio equipment to do this. So there's not really much security at that. But pretty much what have to do is set up you'd have to set up something that looks like a real tower. Then the strongest signal is automatically selected by the phone. It connects that tower. You have no way of overriding that. And they can intercept anything and everything you send. Actually, um, wouldn't the tower have the decryption algorithm though? That's my point. The decryption Wait. algorithm is public. You're, exchanging, oh, you're using asymmetric encryption, right? So since you're, as the phone, you're authenticating the tower, yes. You have to say, here's my key, and that tower has to be familiar with it. That tower sends you its public key. Your phone cannot authenticate that. There is no authentication of the tower to the phone. So that means as an attacker, I give you my public key. You accept it just because that's the way the protocol works. Right. We then exchange symmetric keys, and I have that encryption key. I see. So the tower, would have, you have everything you would need once. It's basically phone. a man in the middle of attack. It is, that is exactly what it is. Didn't get into that on this because I didn't have time. Basically, your job as an end user, as far as security goes, you need to evaluate the security of the products as best you can and make sure that you protect your keys and passwords. There's not much you can do. Are there any questions about this slide? So using encryption as a developer, which I imagine some people here are going to use it at some point, so this is actually pretty important. This is really important because we're so big on web-based applications. Obviously, if you're connecting on, over the internet, if someone can sniff that traffic, they can get that data. If that server gets hacked, it's this big, central, and really tempting as a result location to hack. You have to use encryption correctly. Another place that it's used a lot, too, is a lot of software companies encrypt their data and software to attempt to protect their intellectual property. Because they, unless you're using a hardware dongle, it doesn't work very well, to be honest with you. Uh, usually you can find that key because it's random and it's random amongst structured data because code is inherently structured, whereas a key is inherently random. So you can actually take and make an image out of the bits. So if it's a zero, you make it white. If it's a one, you make it black. You take an image, and you've got these pixels. So you have fairly orderly pixels and then static. And then orderly pixels, that static, your key. Uh, as a developer, you have to understand the best practices for implementing encryption. Once again, do not use XOR encryption. This is probably what you're going to do if you just make it up an algorithm. Do not do that. I will be ashamed of you if I find out. Um, hey, I've said it a lot. What do DVDs use for encryption? Uh, no, the flaw had to do with the fact that they had to repeat the key. Okay. Um, that's pretty technical, so I'm trying to keep this relatively high level. No, it's okay. But it was the same thing that, that they found it, out how they broke it because they, they found somebody's key yeah. There, there's like, there's the, like a dozen different keys or whatever for DVDs, and everyone was assigned one key. The, there was four. Somebody found that, that some. There was a master key. The there was a master key. However, what you're saying when you say that is actually, I believe that's Blu rays. DVDs flat out got broken. I remember um, bringing it with DVDs because we were trying to play DVDs well, on Linux. And that was uh, I know. I've it, it, all, it had really weak hardware, too. Yeah. Actually, that's. He talks about that. The guy who does the cryptography course I mentioned does talk about that particular event. Uh, anyway, 
even if you're using existing libraries instead of implementing your own algorithm, you got to be really cautious because it's still easy to screw it up. And finally, this talk is not something that qualifies you to do encryption. If you're going to be writing software using encryption, you're going to have to put more time into it than just this. Are there questions? Okay, when you talk about use, when you're writing software that uses the encryption, you're saying you're not just using encryption to hide the software that you're making. You're actually trying to write software that utilizes. Yeah, that's, that's utilizing an encryption library. Even that is risky. It's hard to do correctly. There's a lot of ways to screw it up. It's like the, the modes of operation I talked about. You're often in charge of that when you're using a library. If you pick ECB, Electronic Cookbook, you've just screwed yourself already. It takes experience to understand how to use it correctly. Another thing is if you go look up online for, like, say, password-based encryption on Java, an easy example to find uses BES. So if you don't understand how encryption works, you may go ahead and use that, and that's really weak. Any other questions? So here's my end another thing. I have a little analogy. Uh, encryption allows you to convert a secure channel problem into a key management problem, much like a lever converts distance into force. So what I'm trying to say here is encryption does not solve security. It is not, as I say, a magic wand to secure a system. It is instead a useful tool that lets you trade off the management of a secure uh, channel or actually as well the management of secure storage with a key management problem. Now the thing is, as far as secure channels go, it is easier for us to create a secure channel and then deal with key management because key management is done locally, which means it's less uh, exposed to an attacker. So does this make sense to everyone? Because this is, in my opinion, a key thing. And I put it at the end to hammer it into your heads. This is a key thing. Encryption is not a magic fix for everything. All right, so cryptography lets us protect our data and test it. Well, cryptology lets us test it as well. AES is what you should use. Don't use it in the ECB. Asymmetric cryptography avoids the cost of exchanging keys in person. Hashes let you buy, verify that data is unchanged with quite a degree of certainty. Encryption is important across a lot of different areas of, it, of computing. And of course, encryption is not a one-size-fits-all solution for security. You have to actually evaluate each system and decide what solutions you need to apply to actually secure it. Oh, were there questions? And so finally, here's my references. Here's the one I was mentioning earlier about the cryptography course. I haven't actually read applied cryptography yet, like I said, but I want to. Computer security is a fairly decent textbook. It's a bit of a thick read. And then, of course, there's the Code Breakers by David Kahn.